For the wheels of a Tesla to spin or sound to come out of your iPhone, they all require a tiny piece of metal called neodymium. It helps turn electricity into motion, and it's one of 17 important minerals called rare earths, which are in many of the electronics we use every day. But now, your tech could be under threat. Well, the fundamental challenge is the complete and total dominance of China. In the past few years, 80% of U.S. rare earth imports have come from China. And that's an issue because of concerns that Beijing could cut off access to the U.S. There's going to be a need for many more rare earths and on a much more secure basis than the presently politically charged Chinese monopoly. So the U.S. and its allies are building their own supply chain. We're going to be producing at least 50% more than we do today. We follow the new players in the neodymium supply chain as they seek to break China's monopoly. To understand how China got so big, let's rewind about 30 years. It all started with Deng Xiaoping, China's leader back then. Deng Xiaoping is reported to have said that Saudi Arabia has oil, but China has rare earths. Jeffrey Wilson is the research director at the think tank Perth U.S. Asia Center, which is partly funded by the Australian government. He's been watching China's rare earth policies for the past decade. The Chinese government started developing uh, the rare earth sector as a strategic national industry in the late 1980s. And that was built on a recognition that rare earths would be really critical to a number of the technology sectors that were emerging. With that foresight, Beijing rolled out tax rebates and subsidies that helped the industry flourish. By the end of the millennium, the country became all dominant and could influence global prices. For instance, in 2010, it cut export quotas that caused the price of some rare earths to surge tenfold. And China's control over the industry was a geopolitical tool during the trade war with the U.S. China has been taking advantage of the United States for many, many years. When the Trump administration threatened to cut off supplies of chips and processors to telecom giant Huawei, Beijing said it was a threat to its national sovereignty and warned that it could stop the export of rare earth materials to the U.S. The Chinese government didn't pull the trigger, but as tensions escalated, some companies decided to take action. Here we have one of the richest known deposits in the world. This is the first stop in an alternative neodymium supply chain, Mount Weld in Western Australia, where Amanda Lacaz's mining company digs rare earths out of the ground. It was once a volcano, and there are rare earths found throughout that, and this shows the tiny little bit that we have actually mined at this stage. Lacaz runs Linus, the largest rare earth producing miner outside of China. She says these minerals are actually not that hard to find, but the difficulty is turning them into something usable. The rare earths actually come out of the ground and they're all married together. And then we put it through our concentrator so that by the time it leaves here, about about 35% of the material is rare earths. Lacaz has been trying to extract more from these rocks because recently she says companies have told her they want to buy more. So to keep pace with growing demand, Linus is expanding. This is a new plant we're going to build. Linus raised about $330 million last August to upgrade processing facilities. Around the same time, the company won a U.S. Department of Defense contract to build a new plant in Texas. It would process rare earths needed to produce military weapons and electronics. Once these expansions are finished, industry analysts expect Linus to produce a quarter of the world's concentrated rare earths. But neodymium still has a long way to travel after Australia, and before it ends up in your phone. These rocks typically have five more steps to go, where they have to be processed and turned into metals, like at this facility in the UK. So this is a sample of neodymium metal that's melted together with iron and boron and some other additives to make the alloy. Ian Higgins is the managing director of Less Common Metals near Liverpool. Industry experts say the company is one of the few outside of Asia that can turn the rocks into metal pieces. Then some of these go directly to tech companies, automakers, or end up in Formula One cars. Higgins didn't immediately begin selling neodymium metals to big companies. When he started his new operation in 2017, he turned to industry leaders for advice. So the kind of business model we're putting together would involve essentially copying the Chinese. 
He purchased machines from China and before the pandemic was visiting Chinese plants up to three times a year. Today, he's honed the technique and even automated some of the process, but his metals still aren't cheaper than China's. Higgins says the price of Western neodymium products are around 20 to 25 percent more expensive. And one big reason is a challenge that all rare earth producers face, pollution. Linus refines its neodymium at a processing plant in Malaysia, which releases a type of radioactive residue. After protests from the local community, Linus said it plans to use part of the $330 million in expansion funds to move back some of the polluting work to Australia. Wilson says environmental regulations in China are looser, and this has helped domestic rare earth companies stay competitive. For example, China produces heavy rare earths using a technique called in situ leaching, where acid is poured directly into the ground. This is a mining technique that is practically unusable due to its environmental costs in most Western countries. Over the years, Beijing has said it's taking measures to protect the environment and encouraging rare earth enterprises to use efficient and green technologies. This colors represents different grade of rare earths. For the Western supply chain, Lacasse says sustainability will be key. The whole ecosystem in which we're involved is ending up with products which are sold on the basis that they're good for the environment. Well, that is absolutely no good if we trash the environment along the way. And it's still a long way for this new supply chain, especially as it tries to catch up with China's three decades worth of investments. For instance, in order for the West to produce 2,000 tons of magnets a year, which is enough for one million cars, Higgins says one option would be to open a new mine, and that would cost up to one billion dollars. So he suggests taking a page from Beijing's book. They enjoy extensive amounts of state support, subsidies, tax rebates. The help of government is absolutely essential to allow this coordination to take place. Government support is starting to come in. Last year, the Trump administration's pandemic aid package included $800 million to fund rare earth research. The Biden administration also said it's reviewing the supply chain to protect U.S. interests. Allies are also on the move. Last year, the European Union kickstarted a $12 billion investment program for rare earth and green energy projects. Higgins and Lacaz aren't alone in their supply chain efforts. We have this incredible mission, which is to restore the rare earth supply chain back to the Western Hemisphere. Other companies are opening or expanding mines and processing facilities in various places like the U.S., Australia and Tanzania. Meanwhile, some tech companies have expressed concerns over how rare earths are sourced. Apple said it's transitioning to recycled rare earth elements, which are already in several of its products. For now, the new players are ready to make change. Europe, the UK, in North America and Australia, we need to collaborate. We're looking forward to really reboot the rare earth supply chain.